Good morning, everyone. We're going to start our next class today on the Capuchin Charism, recapturing the Capuchin Charism. In our last class, we talked about Capuchin austerity, the meaning of austerity, the importance of austerity for uh, the spiritual life. And today we're going to follow up on that. So we saw how uh, in the early Capuchins, the austerity and poverty um, and penance had three particular areas, food, clothing, and shelter. These are three areas that they looked at when looking at poverty, the food of, we eat, the quality, the type, and so forth of food, the amount of food, and then uh, also clothing and uh, buildings. And when we say buildings, we mean everything inside the building away, uh, as well. So we should say like possession. So we'll see that. So in our last conference, we talked about the poverty and austerity of food. And so now we're going to continue with those same principles of few, poor, and necessary by looking at Clothing, the second uh, aspect of Capuchin austerity, poverty, slash penance. So what has been said about Capuchin austerity in food, we can likewise be, can likewise be said for Capuchin austerity in clothing. There are three basic areas concerning austerity and clothing. Few, poor, and then the key word here would be coarse. Few, poor, and then coarse. For St. Francis... Austerity in, in clothing is scripturally based. So Francis took that gospel to heart of take nothing for the journey, no second tunic, right? That was Francis's um, uh, embracement of the gospel that he would not have a second tunic. And the rule is quite firm on the amount of clothes we should have, right? And we vow and profess the rule of St. Francis. And so if we're going to profess the rule, we preserve, we uh, pr profess to observe the rule. And so the rule is quite firm on the amount of clothes we should have. It says one tunic without a hood, a cord, drawer, drawers, and a second tunic without a hood and a mantle. T-shirts, socks, thermals, shorts, sweats, and so on, they are permitted, but it's not part of the rule. Um, so I, I look at my closet, and I ask myself, well, we don't have closets, but we look into our shelf there and we ask, you know, uh, are, are the amount of clothes I have few and necessary? Okay. Am I depriving a poor person of my unneeded extra stuff? So if I have extra stuff that's not necessary, am I withholding that from a poor person who could use that? All right. Remember how St. Francis was so willing to give away anything he had when he was asked, for something, right? Sometimes you even just give the sleeve of his habit. You know, I'm not recommending you cut your habits up, right? However, we should have that willingness to give the extra that we have. What did our Lord say? If someone takes your cloak, give them your shirt as well, right? So if we have stuff in our closets, it means there's somebody who doesn't have in theirs. If it's something we don't need, unnecessary items. So I'm sensitive to American culture. And so in our American culture, as we look at it, we have to ask the things that we normally use in our American culture truly necessary, or are they simply um, extras that we become comfortable with and used to because the rest of the culture uses and has them? Stuff like the extra T-shirts and things, you know. There is the reality of uh, different climates. You know, you're in a colder climate, there might be a need for that extra layer. You know, Francis learned that when he... Um, went to the friars went to Germany and came back and said that they needed more clothes there in Germany. It was a bit colder than it was in central Italy. And so Francis made uh, permissions uh, for those areas where there was, keyword, necessity. Necessity. You don't deprive yourself of what's needed, right? That would be foolish. However, we have to be careful. We don't turn wants and desires and comforts into necessities when they're not necessities. Okay. So then also we look at quality. So here I'm thinking of the quality of food and austerity. I'm reminded of one of our principles. I'm oh, sorry, I'm on the wrong page. <laughs> so going back, we're staying with where we were uh, on that, uh, with what we need, okay? So we look at the missionaries of charity as an example of uh, quantity, right? So the missionaries of charity have a custom that all their belongings should fit in one box. So when they move from one comma to another, 
Uh, all the sister's belongings fit into a box this big, you know, like the size of those copy paper boxes, you know, or those banker's boxes. All their stuff fits into that one box. That's their custom, the missionaries of charity. And so we who profess poverty, that's our flag vow, we should say, in one sense, uh, you know, we should be trying to live up to that uh, image that Mother Teresa herself gave us. So uh, am I honest about my necessities? That's a good question we need to ask ourselves and examine our conscience on. Or am I concerned about my comfort? Do I prefer comfort? Or in living by necessity and offering up those comforts of wants and desires, in living by necessity and having to sacrifice those comforts, uh, do I prefer the salvation of souls and offering those things for the conversion of sinners? So our constitutions make it pretty simple for us to keep our clothing poor. When we only have a tunic and a habit and some underclothing, it's hard to get fancy. I do sometimes wonder about our footwear. Uh, boots we have. We, uh, boots are boots, but poor boots are uh, versus good boots is a question. Let me say that again. Kind of getting tongue tied today, right? So we need boots for certain weather and certain conditions. It's a necessity, right? So there are good boots that are good and healthy and strong that we need. And then there are boots that are fancy boots, uh, those high quality boots, and those name brand boots, you know? Um, so have we ever tied up our boots saying, these are really awesome boots. They're such and such a brand. We got them free, but they're expensive boots, dude, right? That keyword, they're expensive boots. The expensive name brand things might be just as good as one that's not, That's that would be necessary for our work, where the fancier name brand, although good, might not be the necessity. But also, they need to be poorer, you know? Um, so I could say the same thing about our sandals, you know? They are to be plain, poor, and without ornamentation. You know, I'm not sure Birkenstocks fits the description. You know, you see many times, you know, friars always wearing Birkenstock sandals. They're like the, you know, religious life sandal of the day. You know, you want to be religious, go out and buy your Birkenstocks, you know. And uh, But yet they're expensive sandals, and I'm not too sure uh, that they fit the description that we have in our constitutions of plain, poor, and without ornamentation. You know, a, a rubber pair of sandals from... Uh, you know, Walmart for less than six bucks might be easier to beg than $170 sandals from Birkenstocks, you know. Now, granted, some people might have foot issues where necessity may require a better shoe sandal for when need, needed to be worn. However, we should always be careful that we're not shooting after the name brand, you know. With the amount of time we wear sandals, which isn't much, should we be wearing the best name brand of sandals? So, uh, you know, you think to us, am I feeling uncomfortable right now as I'm looking at my sandals, if I'm wearing any? Um, if I'm feeling a little guilty about the name brand of my sandal, well, that might not be a bad thing, you know? Uh, whenever there's a little guilt there, it's good. It makes us prick our conscience to concern, okay, am I doing the right thing or not? You know, I may well be, so I get rid of the guilt. If I'm not doing the right thing, well, that's a good thing, because then I can straighten that out. So we always want to reevaluate our poverty. You know, that's something as Franciscans we always have to be doing because it's so easy for things to creep in that slowly it's like the frog in the boiling pot. You know, it doesn't realize the pot's getting hot. We don't realize at times that we're losing our poverty. And so it's always good for us to re-examine that which we've accepted as normal when, in fact, they're not necessities. They're comforts or things we just don't need and we're depriving others of things that they could have. So I'm asking questions because we need to figure out if we are being hypocritical. Barefoot friars who wear sandals only rarely, but when they do, they only wear the best, right? Uh, do we want this set of us? You know, those friars, they don't wear sandals, but when they do, oh my goodness, they got the good stuff. You know, it's kind of hypocritical, especially if we want to associate with the poor. Can our neighbors afford the shoes that we wear that people give us, you know? Can they afford the sandals that I'm wearing? You know, good for us to consider and to evaluate. So Capuchins always lean toward the coarse materials. Here we once again consider the custody of our senses. Our Lord commended St. John the Baptist his coarse habit. We should, you know, his coarse habit. Our Lord commended that. 
And again, this is something right out of the 1536 Capuchin Constitutions. Okay. So uh, Jesus asked, you know, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? The habit is the very cross with which we clothe ourselves. It is rough feel should remind us of the cross. It should help us to contemplate the passion of Christ. It should be that cause reminder that we have been crucified to the world and the world to us. As we feel the coarse wool against our bodies, we should be hearing the words of our Lord, our Lady at Lords. Penance, penance, penance. Or the angel of the, of the secret of Fatima. Penance, penance, penance. The habit is intended to be rough, coarse, harsh. Uh, back in the day, I once um, washed my habit in my sister's house during a home visit. And unthinkingly, I threw in the fabric softener. And my sister couldn't stop laughing. I said, what? You know, she responded, doesn't fabric softener defeat the purpose? <laughs> and I started laughing and thinking, yeah, you're right. It does defeat the purpose, you know, throwing fabric softener in with my rough, coarse habit. You know, I wasn't even thinking of the fact that I was throwing, I was doing the natural thing you would do with laundry, you know, and uh, softening the fabric defeated the purpose of having a rough, coarse habit, which should be reminding me of the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, you know. So tell me, are we doing anything to soften our habits, right? Uh, is my undershirt for comfort or for warmth, you know, when we have to wear undershirts? And by avoiding the coarseness of the habit, uh, is the T-shirt for cleanness or ease when we have to wear them underneath, you know? All I'm saying is we need to always check our motives, you know? Uh, check to see if I'm, uh, you know, really wearing it out of necessity or am I wearing it to avoid the coarseness of it, you know? It's okay to wear it for necessity. It's okay if that's a necessity and so forth for warmth or for, you know, health purposes or whatever. But, um, you know, we always have to check our motives to make sure it's not there because we still want to avoid the coarseness of the habit, avoid the cross. You know, until we started this community, I always avoided the coarse wool to my skin. You know, in previous communities where we had wool habits, I would wear a T-shirt and avoid that. And uh, my conscience was pricked about that. The rule, the early Capuchins, austerity, poverty, and penance won me over. I began to read the rule more closely. I began to examine Capuchin life more closely. I began to consider poverty more intensely, as well as austerity and penance, and realized, oh my goodness, I was running from the cross. I was trying to keep the cross, cross, coarse wool off my skin. So St. Bonaventure's... Um, a professor, I believe it was Alexander of Hales, he didn't want to become a Franciscan because he didn't want to wear the rough wool. You know, when he was at the University of Paris, his professor was an incredible man, Francis of Hales. Um, uh, um, his name is uh, my mind again, once again, Alexander of Hales. Uh, he didn't want to wear the rough wool, and that's why he didn't want to become a Franciscan. He felt the call and everything else, but he just did not want to wear that wool. So he had a dream of Jesus. And uh, he saw Jesus carrying the cross, and he, Jesus was being crushed under the cross. And in his dream, he ran over to help Jesus pick up the cross. And Jesus told him, no, if you can't carry a cross of wool, how will you help me with this cross? If you can't carry the cross of wool, how will you help me with this cross? And that really inspired Alexander to uh, join the Franciscan order and live a very penitential life. And that was the professor to both St. Bonaventure and to St. Thomas Aquinas, you know? So he awoke from his dream and he entered the order. Okay, moving on now. Let us look at the third area of Capuchin austerity and that's austerity in buildings. This is just not about the make, material, size, and expense of the building. It includes all the stuff in the buildings. So when they the Capuchins saw talking about poverty and austerity of building, they just don't mean the building itself, but everything contained within the building. Okay? So once again, the buildings and the things we use should be according to early Capuchin austerity. Few, poor, and necessary. Uh, FPN. Right? Get those letters, those words stuck in the mind, in the conscious thinking when we're evaluating, should we have this? Can we have this? Is this appropriate? 
we should be asking that question, few, poor, and necessary, okay? So I don't think I need to spend much time going through each and every area of the friary, nor do I need to spend time beating a dead horse by repeating what I've already said about clothes and food. After all, you should have this inscribed on your hearts. Every Franciscan, every person called the Franciscan life, whether he accepts it or not, whether he is going to in somehow, shape, or form, um, you know, rationalize, uh, rationalize it, each and every Franciscan who has the charism, has the DNA, knows that all things that they use should be few, poor, and necessary, and they, that they must be poor among the poor. And they know when they're rationalizing. We all know what I've, I've rationalized in the past, this or that thing, or this or that behavior, or this and that way of living, when I knew, in fact, it wasn't right. And the very fact that I was rationalizing made me wake up, that I was making excuses for what I knew to be true in my heart, what I was avoiding to live in that truth. So um, what I will say is that convenience and need are not the same thing. Convenience and need are not the same thing. This or that thing may be convenient to have, but can we live without it? If I can live without something, then we should. Why are we depriving the poor of their share? If I can live without this thing, then I should give it to the poor if I can live without it, if it's a convenience and not a necessity. So I charge the guardians and vicars to clean house, and I mean it. Clean house. Any unnecessary item must be given to the poor. Friars voluntarily offer the guardians evaluation of things we don't need. Have that conversation. Do we need this? Do we need this many of this? Are these things necessary or are they conveniences? We need to always, that's why we have the poverty check twice a year. Twice a year we go through the friary. Friars go through their individual personal rooms. And we look to ask that question. Do I need this many of this? Is this a necessity? Is this truly poor? And if it's not, out the door, right? And to the arms of those who do need them. You know, uh, you know, we offer an inconvenience. We can offer it to the Lord as a sacrifice and a penance for the conversion of sinners, for the salvation of souls and so forth, reparation for our past sins. But when we give it to someone who may need it or might be a convenience to the poor person next door, it eases their suffering. It eases their struggle. It makes life better for them. And we should be always seeking to better the life of those around us, to ease their suffering. Okay? Our Lord was born in a stable. He lived by necessity in Egypt and Nazareth. He had nowhere to lay his blessed head. He died poor on a cross and was laid in a borrowed tomb. Our friaries are borrowed. We are mendicants and we get transferred from one friary to another. We too must live by necessity in imitation of the poverty of our Lord Jesus Christ. So our constitution said that we should accustom ourselves to privations. This doesn't just mean that we learn to bear the cold or hunger or roughness of the habit. It doesn't mean that we simply learn to tolerate what the poor tolerate. It is not an unwanted share and an unwanted suffering. It is not a boast. It's not a boast to the poor. I know I'm poor just like you. Or a boast to the wealthy. I gave up what you have. Ha ha. Or to other religious. Ha ha ha. ha. We're poor and you're rich. Ha ha. It's not that at all. We're boasting to ourselves. I'm poorer than the brothers and so-and-so, right? It's not about boasting, you know? It's not about an unwanted share, an unwanted suffering. It doesn't mean that we simply learn to just tolerate what the poor tolerate. It's more than that. By being accustomed to privations, that means that we choose the cross. That we choose the cross. We know that it is our road to salvation. We want to pick it up. We want to follow our Lord. We want to be Simon of Cyrene on the way to Calvary. 
we would respond to that beautiful invitation of the Lord, that beautiful counsel of the Lord. He who wishes to be perfect must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. He who wishes to be my disciple must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Penance, poverty, prayer are interlinked and for us lead us to or are born from austerity. Penance, poverty, and prayer are interlinked and for us lead to or are born from austerity. It is clear from what we have seen that poverty leads to austerity. If we're living a poor life, we're going to live an austere life. The poorer we are, the more austere our life will be. But poverty, like austerity, is not an end in itself. Our goal is not to be poor, austere guys. We must stay poor and austere, but not on to other more than, but on to other more noble purposes, right? Holiness, salvation of souls, reparation for sins, union with, with God. We must stay poor and austere on to other more noble purposes. Holiness, salvation of souls, reparation for sins, union with God. This being said, poverty leads to austerity, but penance and prayer are born from austerity. Austerity allows me to enter upon a life of self-denial. It gives me the opportunity to obey the gospel precept. He who would be my disciple must deny himself. The gospel command of our Lord, repent, do penance. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. In all the areas of our Capish and Franciscan life, food, clothing, buildings, we are given a multitude of opportunities to live a life of penance. St. Francis once called the order, Penitence from Assisi. He said, the Lord gave me the grace to do penance. The Lord gave me the grace to to do penance. By the gift of our Capuchin charism, we too have been given the grace to do penance. It's a grace. It's a gift from God. It's his gift to do penance. The Lord gave me the grace to do penance. Am I accepting this grace or am I rebelling against this grace? I know there are times I'm accepting the grace and I'm all in. Other times I'm rebelling against the grace. Because I'm looking for my own conveniences and my own comforts. We all do it. But we said about examining. Am I tolerating the grace of penance? Like, okay, I gotta do it, I'll do it. Or am I joyfully entering into it? Am I with my Capuchin forefathers, as the Constitution say, eating the sins of the people? You know? I love that phrase. The early Capuchins were doing penance. Offering them their, their, their austerity and their penances and their prayer. And they thought saw themselves as feasting. Feasting on the sins of the people. As they made reparation for sins against the sacred heart of Jesus and the immaculate heart of Mary. Bringing souls to conversion and obtaining for them the grace of conversion. Our constitutions tell us that we have a special call to do penance. A special call. And because of our Marian vow... To specifically heed the call of Fatima and make reparation for sins committed against Mary's Immaculate Heart. This is the call of Fatima. Over a hundred years ago, Our Lady asked that we would do penance for the conversion of sinners. So souls don't go to hell. They enter wars. In reparation for sins against the Immaculate Heart of Mary. In reparation for sins against the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Reparation for sins against the Most Holy Eucharist. And if there ever was a time where this was needed, it's now. Am I accepting of this grace? Am I fulfilling that Marian vow, that call of the Blessed Virgin Mary to do penance? Am I really easing the sufferings of the Immaculate Heart? Or by my tolerance of suffering penance, am I adding to it? Am I adding to it? Uh, are our austerities giving birth to penance? Am I making reparation for my sins? Am I doing penance for others? Am I offering penance as reparation for sins committed against the sacred and immaculate heart? When I'm putting on the coarse habit, I really want to put on a nice, comfortable, 
shirt, my offering in reparation for sins against the Immaculate and Sacred Heart. When I want to be out there wearing my jeans and my boots and a t-shirt, <laughs> you know, my offering that in reparation for sins against the Immaculate Heart of Jesus. Immaculate Heart is Mary, Sacred Heart of Jesus. You know, when I want to be sitting in nice, comfortable couches and I hit that hard chair in the refectory, my offering that reparation for sins against the Holy Eucharist. These little things are immense and powerful when offered as acts of love. Once again, love. Austerity should also be a mother to prayer. We have a life that should be free of distraction. Our empty walls, our empty shelves, and those things that keep our senses crisp, alert, sensitive, and focused on the divine. All of it should be leading us to God. These costs and penances should be keeping us aware of God's presence and bringing us into prayer and before the Lord. And it is true that our life can seem severe, stern, somber, strict, ascetic, bare, and it can seem even harsh. And it should be. That's what St. Francis handed on to us. That's what the early Capuchins handed on to us. And I don't just mean the early Capuchins. I mean 250 years, almost 300 years of the Capuchin reform, enduring with such austerity that when people say you're joining the Capuchins, they go, really? They're pretty austere and strict and harsh and so forth and so on. Right? It should be that. Because it's a life of love. It's a life of love. Let us love with a severe love. Let us love with a stern love, for stern as death is love, we're told in the scripture. Let us love, let our love be somber. Let our love be strict and unyielding. May our love be bare of all distractions and all selfishness. May our love be so harsh that hatred, self-centeredness, pride, envy, lust, greed, gluttony, sloth, and wrath can't stand before it. May our love be so harsh that it puts to death all of the vices. Let us love like Christ from a rough wooden cross, from iron nails with a crown of thorns and a scourge back. Let us go about this world as austere, poor, penitential, and mortified men. And like our early confreres, let us sow smiles and good works. Let us be kind, courteous, peaceful, Amiable, let us speak to everyone in a fitting manner. Let us be sons of our seraphic father, and let us be love in this world. Men who love like Christ, men who love in the way that Christ has loved us, giving ourselves completely, totally, unreservedly, limitlessly, limitlessly <laughs> to the one who has loved us. No greater love than this, than to lay down one's life for one's friends. May God bless you. May Mary keep you. And may our Capuchin saints, blessed servants of God and venerables in heaven,